afternoon and welcome to the latest episode of Tech Salescraft with me, James Hounslow. And today I'm really delighted to be joined by James Borum. Good afternoon, James. Good afternoon. Um, How are you doing? You okay? Doing very well. Very well. So you are the VP of Sales over at Dura at the moment. One of the main reasons that I wanted to get you onto the, the show is to talk about how you moved from the banking world into software sales and then into leadership and what um, kind of skill sets that you learned in the banking world that has enabled you to achieve some pretty good success already in software sales. So that's enough for me. In a way of getting started, it would be great, James, if you could just give a little background of your life from banking through to where you are now. So economics degree, shout out to Manchester University for, for that. In terms of uh, going from there, I started my career in investment banking. Um, I started on a trading floor at a company called Citigroup, worked on interest rates, derivatives, sales uh, there at that organization. Um, so still a sales role, but very different in financial markets. That two-year experience taught me a lot about high-pressure situations, uh, communicating with brevity and in a concise way for particularly senior stakeholders, making quick decisions on uh, various aspects um, when you're in interactions with customers. Yeah, and just basically a, a very quick, sharp learning curve uh, in a professional environment. So you reach a level of professional maturity very quickly if you've worked in one of those environments, as I know a lot of people have. Banking is a career that is set up for sort of a a uh, marathon as opposed to a sprint in the fact that careers in banking are no longer five or 10 years and retire um, back yeah. maybe how it was 20 years ago. They're much more sort of 20, 30 year careers. So you've really got to love it and you've got to be in it for the long term. Uh, and it's quite hard to progress ahead of the sort of various levels and the yeah. uh, experience profiles for, for those levels. So for example, you know, you're likely to be VP after five or six years and onwards from there. So chose to move into a, a more meritocratic environment in a technology company. So joined a machine learning based business, um, went through series A, series B with those guys, scaled out the team and sold the company to an American software company. At the time of sort of exiting that business, uh, I ran the sales function in the UK. And yeah, that was a team of around about six to eight people at the time. And then from there, I joined a logistics tech startup guided them through series A and started scaling up and setting up the commercial function, which was previously founder led. And at this stage, I'm at Juro. And so I've been with the business for about something like 16 months now, something around that and started out as director of sales, now VP of sales. And our team sales team's gone from four people and being founder led to being led by me. And we now have a team of around 15 to 16, 17 people. So let's uh, rewind the clock back to when you were in, in banking and you were looking yep. to uh, move out you obviously had a unique set of skills learned from the banking world yep. what made you decide that software sales was going to be where you wanted to go yeah so one thing that was very clear is that technology and software is immensely scalable and immensely profitable banking as a traditional industry is very competitive pretty homogenous products you're providing just purely a service the underlying products are very very similar yeah. so i really love the fact that you can scale businesses extremely quickly and with that comes a lot of exciting opportunities around progression uh, and also just getting a lot of experience and exposure to navigating and helping develop that company and its growth even as someone who's, you know, in their early to mid twenties. Yeah. Um, so they're all aspects that were super attractive. And one thing that's been cool over the last sort of five to seven years, whilst I've been in this industry, in fact, like seven years uh, since I've been in this industry is really the fact that, you know, it's, it's gone from strength to strength, even from then, even from seven years ago, it's just such a bigger place, more capitals pouring in. There are more like exciting London startups. So you arrive on day one at, Leverton, were you set up to knowing that the culture and the environment going from a trade floor to a uh, an office for a software vendor, how different was it and, when you, and, and how quickly did you adapt to how the day kind of panned out in a software yeah. vendor to the trade floor? It was definitely chalk and cheese. I went for a, a floor where you probably have 500 people most of which are sort of screaming at each other to a, an environment where there were two of us in the UK. So a WeWork environment with a couple of people. So me and our UKMD at the time. 
I think one thing that was very like I remember very clearly is that you just kind of build and figure things out yourself like there's no like strong support network or anything like that you're just figuring things out and building things so if you need some marketing collateral if you need you know whatever it may be you just tend to just get it done and make it happen and yes we did have some people to support us but uh, the business was headquartered in germany so we did have like the head office to help us a bit but yeah you just figure things out and to city there'd be like you know five people for every task and you'd go to one of those there'd be a process around it etc so yeah. so i guess part of your decision to join someone like leverton is probably the idea that you take risks being the fact that you come from a banking background but why didn't you join a large corporate like an SAP uh, a SAS where you could learn the trades what made you go into a an organization where there is an MD and, and you and uh, and that's it yeah I just wanted to be on the front line like and I thought if I join SAP I'm gonna have the same challenge that I faced at City which is you know, it's quite hard to make a material difference to the company as a 23 year old. Whereas if I join a business of 20 people, I could make actually a real difference yeah. and become very valuable for them within a, a short time period. So yeah, I love that. Why do you think your MD hired you? Because if I look at the conversations that I have with many sales leaders like yourself, uh, who are in startup positions, looking to bring their first salesperson in, doesn't look like banker uh, as the person you're going to uh, to bring in and do it. Why do you think he, he brought you in and what, what do you think was the reasons why you were so successful when, when coming in and doing it and why other leaders should think like that when, when looking to hire? Yeah, I think firstly, it's a bit of a misconception that everyone who's worked in a bank is a banker. Yeah. There'll be a lot of people that go into banking, accounting, legal services, professional services that don't belong and will not end up being there long term. And they will feel yeah. the way I felt after a couple of years in that environment. And I would also say the skill set you get with someone with that background is they are going to work hard and they are going to be extremely motivated and driven. I think that's like very high probability. So one of the things that I hear time and time again from you know, people building out teams and people in this world is they look for people who are curious and who are, you know, very, very dedicated. And you can, with a, a good degree of probability, guess that people from yeah. that environment will will exhibit those skills. Yeah. So I think that's something that, that was liked. I think as well, the motivations for why I was switching were things yeah. that actually that person could understand and get behind. And me now as a hiring manager, that's one of the number one questions that I ask is like, do I understand this person's story? Like, does it make sense to me or does something just not add up? And I think, you know, the story that I had coming out of banking was, it kind of made sense. And I was genuinely very, very yeah. passionate and interested and I wanted to do the job. And the number of times you speak to people um, in interview scenarios and they're just interviewing at loads of companies and like, you know that. And yeah. It's like, do you actually want to do the job and do you want to do the job here? Yeah. Uh, and the one thing that I always advise, advise people around the recruitment process is ultimately you have to answer three questions and answer them well. Yeah. And that is why that company, why that role and why you? And if you can answer those questions well, you should be putting yourself in a strong position to get any yeah. role. And most people fall down on answering those questions. Very few people can tell you why that company very few people can tell you why that role will do an okay job of telling you why you should hire them. Yeah, interesting. We'll definitely come back on to uh, onto those questions a little bit later. When you joined this this first software company, did they have a, a script, a playbook where you literally just had to read up, digest and go, right, this is how we're going to go and do it? Or was it kind of a little bit of a, here's the deep end, there's your armband, see how you get on? I think that's probably a bit of a loaded question that I, I think you probably suspect you uh, you know the answer to. Um, yeah. And yeah, the, the suspicion is correct, which is there wasn't a huge amount of process in a 20 person company with a sales organization of like a couple of people you're, you're not going to have or a few people, you're not going to have a, a really strong, solid, well tested playbook necessarily. If you do, that's mighty impressive at that stage. Yeah. So it was a lot of being thrown in the deep end. 
Yeah. I vividly remember on week two, I was in a room of 18 link later as a lawyer um, on my <laughs> own trying to explain something that I didn't truly understand. Yeah. And there were a lot of moments like that where in you know, a larger organization, you wouldn't put someone in that situation, but you kind of sink or swim and you yeah. just learn from that experience. And so how long did it take you to actually realize that in software sales that there's science and maths, which is the key to scaling and, and being successful? I would say 12 to 18 months into like that, that career, I really sort of started seeing and valuing the merits of that more and more. Um, not that I wasn't aware of that sort of earlier than that point, but that's really like probably where the tipping point was on that. Um, and my experience ever since has just further validated that. The industry as a whole was probably way too art-based. So the art of sales was was yeah. too heavily relied on until recently. Yeah. And I think actually probably the pendulum has moved very heavily in favor of the, the science side. And I think the thing I would advise anyone coming into this industry is that it really is a combination of the two. You can have the world's best playbook, but it does it does need executing. And there are certain situations where you will get an edge case that the playbook doesn't cover, or you have to use your intuition a bit. Um, yeah. And that's really where you know the art and yeah. the real high quality people will, will step up. Um, and actually, a, another interesting point to this is we've just had um, a couple of people in the office today go to a meeting in person again in London, which has been great to see. Yeah. And again, that's where the art will become more and more apparent. Um, everyone becomes fairly similar over a, a Zoom call. So it's just running things excellently yeah. and militantly that yeah. tends to get results. Yeah. But then suddenly when you're going back to meeting people in person again, it, it will become you know, yeah. more of a... Did you know from day one that you wanted to grow into being a sales leader or did you grow into it thinking actually this is something that I can do because you, you progress quite quickly I wanted to progress quickly and I think originally I probably associated progressing quickly as you have to go down the management route yeah nowadays I know that that isn't you know the the route that you have to go down there are some incredible individual contributors out there who do exceptionally well both financially and progression wise and build 20 30 years careers as, as individual contributors and so that's obviously well clearly now a route that i understand but um i think yeah fortunately the management track was the one the right one the one that i wanted to go down anyway but originally i just saw that as the progression the way you progress but now i am um, you know, fully appreciative of these two separate tracks. But um, yeah, the management track is certainly the right one for me. I mean, the ultimate reason as to why that's the case is I believe you can add more scalable value and coach and yeah. nurture others yeah. um, by going down the managerial track. And for me, there, that is a little bit more fulfilling. So once you were kind of in that leadership role, how were you having that sort of like having that at the same time as kind of being a player coach? So you were still doing the selling? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, generally speaking, yeah, I've been involved in, in keeping up a bit of the selling work, probably a little bit longer than I should have done in, in transparency. And that's a, a good learning that I would take over the last few years, which is it's quite easy to try and be like, I'll, I'll keep on the front line, I'll keep doing these things, I'll keep keep developing that um, and at some point you, you've definitely got to drop it for the, the benefit of everyone else in the team yeah. and I think the tipping point there depending on your organization is probably six to eight direct reports you really need to be dropping your, your quotes to carrying um, certainly you might have a team of BDRs and AEs so you can probably go a little bit over that but I'd be very careful about doing that um, because you have such limited time to focus on their development if you're truly going to do both things. Once you're in this leadership position would you say that you found process even more important than when you were a, a salesperson? A hundred percent, yes. Because you're defining it as rather than following it. So yeah, it's, it's integral. Um, the sort of phrase that we, we often refer to uh, is like we're, we're trying to build this, this engine of growth. So really it's like what goes into that. If you think about like maybe a Formula One team or a car mechanic, there's a lot of tinkering. There's a lot of things that go on under the surface um, and it's building out the right kind of predictable pattern that leads to successful results. And then ultimately a lot of that is down to process. Yeah. So even within your, your seven years in software sales, you've picked up probably some invaluable experience in growth. 
how have you identified so far and I know it's it won't be the finished article but how have you identified when is the right time to decide to hire and the reason why I say that to kind of set the scene is in scale ups a lot of the time the hiring will be triggered based on funding and the and the money arrives and particularly in today's world there seems to be what I would describe as overfunding for certain businesses but whether the funding's there or not is not necessarily the correct time to hire based on processes playbooks and where they are but what key indicators have you seen to look out for that kind of says whether a business is ready to hire I would say so the ultimate answer comes down to like, do you or have you achieved some level of product market fit, which allows you to produce predictable revenue? Um, but what would I look at to sort of indicate those things? Yeah. I mean, rep- repeatably selling a certain profile and type of deal is a very, very good indicator. We got to a stage you know, over the last quarter or two where we're selling basically almost a deal a day. And that feels like a really quite nice milestone for the business of like, we're doing a lot of deals each month. They're of the sort of typical ACV. You know, we're not relying on one deal a month that's yeah. huge and then the rest are really tiny or something like this. Um, there's that degree of predictability. That's a very, very good sign. I think looking at measures like uh, net dollar retention as well. So like how much are you able to, you know, grow and retain your existing customer base as well? Because if you've got to describe it a leaky bucket, then that's an indicator that you might actually be really great at selling, but you're not leading to long-term success that will ultimately build up ARR year after year and compound that. So um, there are tons of metrics on this, but these would be two areas that I'd look at. So once you've you've got that and you realize, right, it's now time to add salespeople, where do you start? What do you think about when hiring uh, candidates? Yeah. So if you have the advantage of being able to look at an existing team yeah. and look at what is and isn't working within that team, that is a really nice starting place. Yeah. Um, so one good example is that we have a lot of success at the moment with developing BDRs, getting those into an account executive role, and they tend to actually be some of our high, highest performing yeah. account executives. Um, so what we will do then and what I generally um, sort of structure the hiring plans around is almost over-indexing on BDR hiring uh, on the basis that you know, we really believe we can turn you know, exceptional young talent into fantastic account executives that will drive a lot of revenue. Yeah. So I think knowing those patterns in your organization, our sales motion is quite mid-market based. Um, yeah. So if you're selling like huge deals, very complex, very long sales cycles, you're probably going to have a really different hiring motion, which is going to be much more, we want people who've been doing this 10, 15, 20 years, uh, and they can evidence a really strong track record of selling that profile of deal. Um, it really depends on your sales motion. So I'd look at your average contract value. I'd look at your sales cycle length. Uh, I think about the steps involved in that. Think about how much complexity there is there and, and hire around that. A really interesting point that you put there for the BDRs. Um, so yeah. let me just question you around that for a moment. Do, do the BDRs report into you? What's yeah. for it? Yeah, so I have a BDR manager these days. Yeah. Um, so up until around about three months ago, the answer to that question is yes, but now it's 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 no longer the case. That's the first manager I've hired. And so you've been coaching these guys throughout their journey for when they, they've been brought in. How much of that do you think is an influential part that those... BDRs have moved through the journey into account executive and have you thought about how you're going to make sure that continues to happen now that there's somebody between you and them yeah that's this is like the um the like huge challenge with growing and scaling and things like that and I think that comes back down to the process point so it's how do I teach someone to coach and develop in the way that I previously have done perhaps successfully and uh, and develop these people I think one thing that I would emphasize is that I envisage myself being and playing a, a role in coaching this type of seniority and experience level in our team for many years to come um, I might not be able to do it quite as frequently but it's still something I'd love to be involved with because it's very fulfilling and it's very important um, so would prioritize it but ultimately yes it's giving someone one of your managers the toolkits to be able to develop these people in the way that you have previously and I think that's the skill of being a manager of managers is being able to teach um, someone who is already a good manager how to become great and, and really coach and develop a team. 
do you hire BDRs based on the fact that you think they can become account executives? Because the reason why I ask that, I've talked to a lot of sales leaders when they're talking about scaling and they want to hire a lot of salespeople. Yeah. Um, and I say you've got to have a good percentage come from your SDR or your BDR team because it's an internal they're people that you know like and trust and they get who you are and also because scaling is so expensive normally bringing in an account executive from outside is going to cost you more money than having somebody come through the, um, the bdr room. so do you do you look at that when hiring for, for bdrs or is it you hire them for the bdr function and see if they if they can uh, make it as an account executive afterwards we definitely look for that when we're hiring BDRs. Uh, I, I'm so, I'd struggle to think of a single BDR hire we've made, and we've made a lot now. We must have made 10, 15 sort of BDR hires, something around that, where we've hired someone and we've thought they'll be a good BDR, but they won't be a good AE, but we'll still hire them. I, I never would hire a BDR, or certainly not at this point, with the intention of them not being a, a future. And these, particularly these uh, good ones that have come through, how long were they a BDR before you moved them across? It's varied from between 10 to probably 15 months. So the, the very best, I think I can get them there in nine to 10 months, like the very best. Um, and I would say 12 to 15 is, is more sort of the typical range. I think keeping a BDR in a BDR role for 18 months to two years, um, if your deal value is of the size that ours is, so sort of a mid-market deal value, I personally don't believe that's the the right thing to, to do. Um, I think you want to keep people very highly motivated. Um, so that, that's just, just my opinion. Of course, if you're selling enterprise, then it takes a bit more time and things like that. So each their own a bit on that. But. Just touching in there while we're talking about hiring then, the, you've got those three questions, why the company, why the role, why you? How did you set on those questions being something that gives you answers that makes you comfortable about whether or not this is the right person to hire? Because I like them. Um, I like it a lot. But what, what's your reasoning behind it and what are you looking for? Yeah, I think that would be less about like how we would recruit. It would be more how I would recommend anyone to prepare for a, any yeah. role really um so that's not necessarily how we would ask questions or yeah. anything like that we'll ask questions a lot in relation to our, our company values so will they be a cultural fit i'll dig into you know people's achievements inside and outside of work quite a lot i like people from you know sporting backgrounds military backgrounds um i think again it says something about their character yeah. ultimately i'm looking for people who have stuck at things even when they got difficult um so it doesn't have to be sporting or military based it could be you know something musically it could be honestly anything but if i can go into detail about something that someone's done for years and years and years and they've really stuck to it and it's been bloody hard and like 99% yeah. of people have given up that's a really really good signal because uh this can be tricky at times. So um, I think that's a, a good sort of proxy. Would you say that you look for A players or potential A players? The easy answer here is potential A players because I want to develop A players and make them exceptional, add to their skills, and things like yeah. that. If I can find A players to hire instantly, then yes, of course. I think that's ultimately yeah. the end goal for anyone in this, this situation. There is a, a finite amount of, of A players available and like already molded into that. So yeah, I think one thing I would always watch out for in someone who, even if they are an A player, um, is are they still willing to be coached and nurtured? Mm -hmm. Because someone being an A player in one environment doesn't necessarily predict that they will be in another one. I think great salespeople can be great salespeople in any organization, but they should also be humble enough to take the learnings of that organization and things like that. Um, and I'll give you a good example of this. When I came into this business, I was used to selling a slightly more enterprise deal. And I thought selling mid-market would be really straightforward. I thought, you know, working that way around I'll be absolutely fine. Um, and actually, I was pretty naive about the fact that there's a real skill set to nailing mid-market yeah. deals and predictably selling, shortening sales cycles. Yeah. So um, I think it's quite easy to think you can uh, can do it all. And actually, in reality, you need to be extremely humble and be like, what are my limitations? Have I actually done that before? Can I learn from the people I'm working around? Even if they've got less sales experience than me, they might have far greater experience in that environment under those conditions. Just going, touching quickly on uh, your days at Shipmatch where you went through Series A funding. Yeah. 
just to talk some of the um, the audience who may be about to do that for the first time. Yeah. What was the founder or the the VCs looking from you? What sort of information were they asking for as a leader? We would talk through like what type of sales methodology are you using? How do you plan to scale the team? What what does the sort of pipeline look like? Quite typical stuff on these. Um, I think ultimately what someone's looking at as a, an investor in that scenario is, is there alignment between the leadership team and the founders? I think that's one thing that's very critical. Um, and is, is that leader honest about what challenges they are likely to face? That is often a question that I've been asked by investors right left and center it's like we get that you guys are doing well we get you have a plan it looks pretty solid it looks pretty typical but what are your challenges uh, and what are the risks in this plan and the answers that i would always recommend giving and i do give in these scenarios is to be you know really transparent and really honest about this and ultimately they're not expecting perfection but they are expecting you to be aware of what the risks, what the challenges will be and, and how you're working to address those. So I think that's the single biggest thing I would highlight apart from all the very typical stuff of like pipeline, yeah. hiring plans, et cetera. And if you were talking to people who were in a, a similar place to you working at a investment bank right now, but considering <laughs> their options, what advice would you give them to moving into the world of sales? Because there are a lot of people trying to do it right now, as you can imagine. I would personally pick an environment where there is a strong playbook and there is a really scientific approach to selling because you'll learn the art over time. You'll be able to develop and work on that. And I would rather be grounded in the science of selling first rather than the art. I think I did that the the other way around. And if I was to recommend it, I think it's probably a slightly easier process to go through a really good playbook learn exactly what that looks like rather than doing that second rather than yeah first so um yeah that would be my advice pick a a place also try and pick a business that you know suits your style your culture that you'll enjoy a team that you'll enjoy working with i mean one piece of advice i'd have is like try and get some insight into meeting the team socially before you join and things like that because if you're going to be part of a bigger team getting on with those colleagues making sure that it is an environment where yes there's some healthy competition but you will get support from your peers there will be a group of you going through that together so you are acting like a team i think that's imperative as you're learning so yeah these would be things that i would uh, would advise i think you're obviously doing a great job at Jura at the moment. Um, before I let you go, what's the plans for you guys going forwards? Yeah, continue to scale, um, continue to grow as quickly as we humanly can. Our sort of ambitions, our targets revenue-wise, coverage in terms of like the customers we serve, how we serve them product-wise, et cetera, continue to go up and continue to develop. Um, so I think... Our plans are just keep keep up good work, keep working hard, like never get complacent and just keep developing a, a better product and keep developing how we sell it more effectively. And um, yeah, we're going to have a team that can we reach a, a wider and wider audience as we continue to scale. So yeah, the main thing for us is setting up and, and making sure we have those scalable processes and then executing on, on what we say we're going to do. I think the most important part of that is, like I say, not getting complacent and just keep getting better, keep working on how you can improve. You can always improve. Did you have to really look at the process and the playbook when the world went almost fully virtual or did the playbook that you have kind of work in the virtual environment? The playbook I had worked in a virtual environment, but onboarding and certain aspects of it, you definitely have to reconsider. So the learning through osmosis that goes on in an office environment uh, is just taken away from you. So you have to do creative things to uh, to set up and create that environment. So an example that I, I can't say that I came up with this idea myself, but I do think it's an excellent one. So I wanted to share it is doing something like a film review and get, you know, your team on a call, you'll pick out like a discovery call or, you know, a handful of cold calls and you'll go through them together, have a scorecard, like sort of rate, provide positive, provide constructive feedback on those. And you're creating an aspect or an environment with a, while still virtual, 
replicates that scenario of overhearing your colleague on a great call or overhearing your colleague struggle to answer a question that you could perhaps advise them on. So just doing little things like that. I think you just have to have little initiatives, little check-ins. Um, one other thing that I've really found to work exceptionally well is instead of doing like a daily stand-up or anything like that, we generally do like a half an hour kickoff at the beginning of the week to get everyone fired up, talk about forecasting. Wednesday morning, we'll do a quick check-in for 15 minutes. Like, you know, so Monday's like, what's the plan? Yeah. What are we going to do this week? Wednesday is like, how's that plan going? But yeah. by the way, it's Wednesday morning. So you've still got 60% of the week to change that. So if you're struggling on anything, we can course correct. Yeah. And then on Friday, you do a little bit of retrospective analysis and you talk yeah. about how things have gone. That tends to work really well as a schedule. I mean, again, it's each business to their own, but I would, would recommend that. That sounds quite good. Okay. Well, I've really enjoyed talking to you today, James. It's, it's, it's fascinating to hear the people that I've spoken to from the banking world that have moved into uh, software sales seem to move very quickly through into the, the leadership's position. So there is obviously something in that in terms of how you're set up and, um, and what you're doing. I think a lot of it comes down to that process and understanding process um, and implementing it. How regularly do you test your process in your playbook and, and look to change it this is a, a balancing act for sure because if you're changing things people are trained on the current process so you have to be a bit careful not to over tinker and you also we've got a few people in our business um, i'd like to think myself included that are quite data driven in their approach yeah. and they would tell you that you want a, a sensible length of time for a testing window to actually get proper meaningful results because you have a high enough sample size to make conclusions yeah. um so I would say every quarter we will make some sort of fairly meaningful change to the, the playbook. It won't be like a complete overhaul, yeah. but it will be we will adjust our SQL criteria or we will, I don't know, yeah. whatever it may be, like just add a couple of elements into the playbook. I think it's important to constantly be improving, considering, reflecting on that but definitely measuring accurately, getting the data you need to make decisions, not making decisions too quickly without them being informed. But then you're also trading that off against making decisions fast enough that you don't get into analysis paralysis. So I would say quarterly to, to make any meaningful updates. So otherwise it's probably a little bit too frequent. But it's always in your mind of making- 100%. The problem, right? That's the thing though, yeah. A hundred, a hundred percent. Yeah. And if it's small stuff, we'll be doing it iteratively all the time. I'm talking about really quite wholesale, meaningful changes. Um, but yes, it's always, always in the mind. Yeah. Perfect. James, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm sure the, the listeners will get a, uh, an awful lot from it. Thank you very much. Yes. Thanks, James. Cheers. If you like what you've heard today, please rate, review and subscribe. We want you to get involved with Tech Sales Craft and become part of our growing community. Thanks for joining us.